Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this episode on uh, my YouTube channel, Hia Salma Somatics. My name is Hia Salma, and I'm a somatic movement specialist and a writer and a speaker. And it is such a great honor today to welcome Maria Luisa Diaz de Leon to our episodes. Today, we're going to talk about a really amazing subject in my view, matters of the heart and dance. Dance, somatic movement, heart, heartbreak, all of these uh, important topics together. Uh, Maria Luisa, Luisa, do you want to tell us something about yourself also? What you do, the kind of work that you've been developing, your background with different uh, somatic movement practices and uh, the mythic work around archetypes that you've been developing and expressive arts, the 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 somatic and imaginary and uh, therapeutic background that you bring to movement is, in my view, simply extraordinary. Ah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I'm just delighted to have this conversation with you. You know, before your press recording, we were just talking about how aligned we are in exploring this theme. And um, a bit about myself, um, a somatic movement educator and therapist and an expressive arts therapist. And so I consider my main lineage of the work that I do presently do comes from the Tamalpa life art process uh, originated by Anna Halperin and also Daria Halperin at the Tamalpa Institute in California. So I started my training there over 20 years ago. And since then, I also been reconnecting with my love for myth and story. Mm -hmm. So I did a graduate program at Pacifica Graduate Institute, where I was able to look at myth story through the lenses of archetypal psychology and the psychology, which is uh, pretty much uh, the psychology that Carl G. Jung uh, generated. And so when I when I went to grad school, I'm just going to tell you a little story because yes. it will help understand a little bit how I end up doing what I do. <laughs> I've always been kind of, it's academia and it's arts and creative expression. One side is academia and the other one is dance and my body. Like, So when I started the training through the Tamalpa process it was a beautiful, just bringing together both worlds. And so when I went, because in the Tamalpa process, we go into the body and really noticing how the body speaks and expresses our own life story, which is also what we consider our personal mythology. And so there were times during my training at Tamalpa where I noticed that my personal mythology connected to some stories that are in the public domain, so to speak. And so that fast forwarding led me to pursue this graduate program. The minute I started the graduate program, I made a promise to myself. I know that I could just dive into books and get really intellectual and scholarly and suffer through it, but also enjoying it. But the promise I made is like, I'm not going to leave the body behind. Mm. Like, no, no way. So every assignment I did through my graduate program, it was, yes, reading. It was about writing. But it was about finding the resonances in my own body. Mm. So that word resonances, which also there's another word uh, that is more grounding, which is metaphors and the Tamalpa work brings me that word, the movement metaphors, the body part metaphors, became really the bridge to transit between the scholarly work with archetypes and imagination and then feeling the body. So reading Carl Jung, James Hillman, he started to dig a little bit more 
and Joseph Campbell also to and I realized that they spoke and wrote about the importance of the body mm -hmm. but I could still see it was more coming from an intellectual part I believe Joseph Campbell's wife was a dancer I think James Hillman's wife was also a dancer or yoga teacher, some movement. So I'm like kind of vicariously kind of filter through <laughs> their own theories. And so I started to, to kind of look at myths and look for the metaphors in mythology that would connect me to my own soma. And I will also go into anatomy and to realize anatomy is mythology. <laughs> it's another way in which we tell ourselves stories about what's going on in our bodies. How is this structure? The physiology is about, you know, other types of story. The endocrine system tells another, another kind of story as well. So, so I started to play with looking at the body through different lenses. So that eventually led me to working with mythology, including anatomy, physiology, somatic movement practices, imagination, dance, creative expression, um, all to kind of bring us into a sense of purpose and meaning so that we don't feel alone in this life we live, that there is this large body which is called humanity who have gone through so many stories of heartache so many stories of heart fulfillment of bravery courage because courage is a word that is also about the heart mm -hmm. and uh, and so that our stories are unique to ourselves to each individual and at the same time, we're, there's no, nothing that humanity has not already portrayed in stories, in myths, in art. So I guess I'm going to stop here. Oh, that's a beautiful story. I love the idea of, of not leaving the body uh, behind. I think um, this is an invitation to all the listeners. Whatever you are doing, whatever the path of life uh, that you're pursuing, may you also not uh, leave the, the body behind. Now, I have many questions, but maybe what I'm going to ask you as a, as a follow-up on your, on your comment here is, can you tell us a little bit more about what a movement metaphor is and maybe also what a resonance is in how, like, how do you use these words, these two words? Yes, thank you. Great questions. So movement metaphor, I'm just going to go very classic uh, from the Tamalpa work. And it's, this is the work of Daria Halprin. And um, movement metaphor is, for, to give you an example, consider a part of the body, which is something we do at the Tamalpa training. And so let's consider the shoulders, the arms, and the hands. And so there is an anatomy involved and a particular repertoire of movement that we can do providing that we are able to move uh, our arms in a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it can be then gestures that express something. So let's say we are holding something. We can drop something. We can reach. We can pull in. We can shake. We, I mean, there's so many movement, <laughs> movements, possibilities in the repertoire of shoulders, arms, and hands. And those become metaphors when we start to then enter into into the story that they may be holding, such as what am I holding? Hmm. What am I dropping? We even say dropping the ball. What does that mean? Or reaching out to what? What are my own stories on reaching out? Or to bring in, close in, or embracing, right? 
So the metaphor becomes like to begin to do the movement imbued with the metaphor that then I can, the movement is not a mechanical movement. It becomes filled with, with my experience of embracing, with my experience of the times that I reach out, with my experiences of dropping something, with my experiences of holding something or offering or shaking or punching or whatever that movement is. So, so far so good with the movement metaphor. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think that's beautiful. That's a, yeah. Hmm. So, you know, that's the way to connect the physiology and the actual repertoire of movement, such as if we go into legs and feet, a pedestrian movement, it's walking. And that has like so many movement metaphors, such as what am I walking towards? Yes. Am I walking in circles? Uh, sometimes I've been working in circles in my life. Sometimes I want to walk backwards, right? So we start to then, we start by just walking and explore the mechanics of walking. But then we start to infuse the dance into something that feels and helps us connect with something of our, about our own lives, such as our walking life. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as movement metaphor. Mm -hmm. The word resonances, I borrowed this word. I listened, I don't know if this is the only person, but I listened to this word from the work of the mythologist Michael Mead. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a fantastic mythologist who actually used to work with James Hillman and Robert Bly back in the days, I don't know if 70s or 80s, I'm not that good at remembering days, working with men. And so Michael Mead works with myths. And I remember watching some documentaries and from his early work. And so he will be drumming. And actually I attended a, a few live sessions with him. He will be drumming and telling a myth, any myth from different parts of the world. And, but he will stop every now and then. And he would say, just feel, you know, enter into the mythic body and just feel what's resonating. And so that then took me into creating my own way of uh, facilitating people to feel their own resonances. And also borrowing from the Tamalpa work because a resonance can be felt as a vibration in the body physically. A vibration could be that I come to a part of the story and my heart skips a bit, for instance. Or I come to a part of the story and I'm holding my breath. So that's a resonance. It's a physical resonance. But there could be resonances that feel more energetic. And, you know, energy is a funny word because... I don't even try to define it, but I know that when people know its energy, they know it. <laughs> and, uh, or could be an emotional resonance, right? I'm coming to this part of the story and I'm just feeling grief. It's not necessarily my grief, but there is a kinship in the story and I feel grief. Or there is an image, a memory that comes. So this resonant, resonating through imagery. So, I often invite in my work with Miss for um, for people to be attentive to the resonances because that is what opens the myth to that particular person as opposed to me telling you what the myth is about or should be or how the myth needs to inform your life. It's more of you know, people saying with their own resonances. So those are the two ways I describe those two words. Oh, that's that's wonderful. The um <clears throat> well, what do you think? Maybe let's move to the topic of the, the heart. Yeah. When you dance in your own practice, or also maybe when you teach your movement practices. Do you dance to connect to the heart? And then if you do, how do you do it? 
I, when I have the intention, yes, I think literally speaking, um, we movement brings up our blood flow and our heart is, can become a little bit more in our awareness, more present, right? Just by virtue of movement, it's, it's more, you know, the pulsation changes. Uh, the heart rate variability changes from being in this kind of state of, you know, sedentary. Um, so certainly dance uh, can help to heighten the awareness on the heart. And one of the things is, do I have the intention to track and connect with my heart? So mm -hmm. I think intention is, is central for, for awareness. And it's also the case that I just started dancing out of wanting to dance. And oftentimes, I'm going to say always, but almost always, within a dance, there are moments of pause or to go slow. Or maybe towards the end of the dance, after things have been stared and moved and experienced, Press, there is that moment of connecting to the body and somehow it takes me directly to my heart mm. to come back to oh what is going on here even I tend to bring my hand both of my hands to my heart and just sense and what I, I, I do something that I call, which is, and just tend to it, mm -hmm. attend to the heart. Because there's something that I can receive by doing that. Could be an awareness, could be a feeling state. And in the Tamalpa work, we often employ this um, prompt, which is, if your body could speak, what would it say? So it's like, if your heart could speak, what would it say? So just as I said, there are many ways to resonate. There are many ways to listen to the heart. And sometimes the heart can then propel me to create an image or create a poem or open my throat and vocalize, bring some vibration or continue the dance in a different way. So I'm talking right now a little bit more of more of my personal connection, yeah. but it often translates into the way I, um, I work with others and I teach this material for which I've created um, a very, simple kind of six session program which is uh embodying your heart's wisdom mm. do you want to tell us about this uh, uh course sure um more than uh tell you about it yeah i want to share with you because this is this is the the ways in which i've started to then say how can i teach this that i'm feeling mm -hmm. I cannot tell anybody what they should feel. I can I don't have the ability to also say how how to listen to their own heart, but I have an idea of many ways in which different people have their own entry points into the heart. So I started to ask myself, okay, so how can I do this? And so there is a myth from, from ancient Mesopotamia, probably you've heard about it, is the myth of Inanna. And she was the queen of heaven and earth. She was loved by everybody. She was, um, she had all these possessions and she had, uh, she was, loved and worshipped everywhere and the story says that one day 
she set her ear to the grate below. Later on the story is revealed that by setting her ear, setting her ear to the grate below, she felt the need to travel to the underworld. Mm. When she arrives at the gates of the underworld, the gatekeeper, I'm paraphrasing here, asks Inanna, why has your heart led you to the road from which there's no return? So after, because this is a myth I studied in my grad school, so after some time with it, started to connect the dots. She set her ear to the grade below. She goes up, she goes to the gates to the underworld before entering and the gatekeeper is saying why has your heart led you all the way here if you know once you go into the underworld you won't be back mm -hmm. so the way I interpreted this is like she's following her heart's calling mm -hmm. she said her ear so she listened to her heart which is in the grade below and so she then had her own initiation, which I'm not going to go into because that's a whole other workshop. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to, to offer how from that point, I thought a starting a good point for this series is to, to learn how to listen to our own hearts. And so the in this, um, I teach about the origin of the heart, how the heart embryologically comes to life, how it's formed. And I offer some other physiological um, information about the heart, about the circulatory system. Um, I did also, uh, for this part, I'm drawing from my studies uh, from the School of Body-Mind Movement, that comes from the lineage of uh, body mind centering, body brain Cohen, Bainbridge Cohen, but I've never studied directly with her. I've studied through one uh, incredible teacher, Mark Taylor. So mm -hmm. he's the founder of the School of Body Mind Movement. And so I did several uh, classes with him and seminars. And so I draw material from there in which I'm able now to have a good sense of how to teach people, you know, the functions of the heart that they, you know, I give the information, but they get to experience them in their bodies. They get to experience their own circulatory system. And then we step into the metaphor about in the circulatory system, it's about a receiving, a filling your own cup and a giving back. Because that's what the heart does. It receives the blood from the veins that need oxygen. The, work doesn't, the, the heart doesn't work in isolation. So the heart gives the blood back to the lungs. The lungs infuse oxygen into the blood and then comes back to the heart. And from the heart goes out into the body. So it's a dance of, you know, being able to uh, recycle recycle our life experiences, to bring them into the oxygen of our creativity, of meaning making. So one other part of this is that the first organ that receives that oxygenated blood is the heart itself. So the importance of self-love comes in. So mm -hmm. you see, I go back and forth from the physiology, the uh, anatomy, using then the metaphor to bring meaning and to draw some concepts that seem a little bit like, you know, talk about self-love. And so instead of thinking about it, like just to, to be marvel at how is there's a cellular wisdom intrinsic in the body about the need to giving love to yourself first before you're gonna give it to anybody else. That's at a cellular level. That's already embedded in the intelligence of our systems. 
So for me, that's like um, quite uh, groundbreaking. Uh, so I, I go into teaching several other aspects that, you know, I'm not going to go a lot into describing right now, but um, we also look at how the, the heart is uh, structured, that it's like a double helix, like a spiral folded in and of itself. Mm. And then uh, the spiral is a very archetypal symbol, right? Mm -hmm. So I would um, connect the image, for instance, of the whirling dervishes from Sufi traditions. Mm. If you remember, they they dance, twirling and twirling in a spiral, one palm of one hand, I don't remember which one, is facing up, the one to the heaven, to the divine, and the other one is facing down to the earth. And the, the dance begins from here, from the heart, slowly unfolding the arms and the dance goes and they become a channel to connect the above with the below so again inana is about going from the above to the below here we have in another different tradition of sufi mysticism with the der we're whirling dervishes also with that archetypal motif so there is a potency here in the heart where we can then reconcile the aboveness and the underworldness of our own life, meaning the conscious part and the unconscious part of our lives. So we do a contemplative dance around in one other session. And so then we move into more like, okay, the alchemical heart, because it's been also the place of a lot of um, chemical substances and exchanges here. Uh, it has a quality to uh, produce some secretes hormonal, uh, not hormonal, glandular, uh, I'm forgetting the word, substances. So it's a chem it's an alchemical vessel, the heart. Mm -hmm. So, and I continue going back and forth and then bringing movement, but it, it keeps adding up. But the ground, the way I always start is, is, is the actual body, the physiology and kind mm -hmm. of the scientific facts about the body, if you will. And then we progress to then go into uh, the alchemical heart and then to the mythical heart. So that's that's a little bit of what the course covers. I think that's a that sounds. I want to take that course. You're welcome. Yes, yeah. <laughs> because you know one reason why I I I'm doing this episode and and wanted to talk to you so much and want to write about this topic also is that I feel like it's not so. Oftentimes in movement classes, let's say, we use this term, connect to the heart, listen to the voice of the heart. But even, and I consider myself to be, uh, you know, movement is one of my one of my practices. And, and even for me, actually, it is not so easy to connect to the voice of the heart. I, I hear my thoughts, I understand what the mind is saying, but to really find the this emotional connection to my heart, I feel like I need to practice it. I need to learn how to do it. I need to tend to the heart, like you were saying earlier. I um, I remember there was one point in my life where I, I turned to my friends, other teachers and colleagues, and I asked them, well, how do you know when your heart is speaking to you? Like, what does it feel like? What, how do you, what's the sensation in, in your body or in your emotional realm? that you have when, you're, when your heart is speaking to you. And it's interesting, people gave me very different answers to this, uh, to this question. So what would, what would you tell somebody like me, or I'm sure there are listeners also who empathize with me, how does one, what to do if one wants to connect to the voice of the heart, wants to know, for example, if, if I should open my heart or should I protect my heart or should I like, what does my heart desire? 
uh, do I need to want to go toward this person or this project or you see all of these confusions that I might have in, in my mental realm also. How do I bring clarity to my life by, by consulting my heart? I'm just excited about this inquiry you're bringing forward because it's about the practice of tending, a cultivation of listening to the heart. And the other part about it is to let go of an expectation that the heart is going to speak in regular language mm -hmm. <laughs> or that you're going to have a, a miracle revelation all of a sudden. I mean, I'm sure it can happen. I'm sure. Yeah. But it goes more into a, and I, I, something that I would call it's, I'm using funny words here, intuition yes. <laughs> or untangible. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a felt sense. It's a kind of letting go of rationalization for a moment. Because one thing that I forgot to say is that very important thing that for some reason you're helping me remember right now is that the heart has a brain. Mm -hmm. There are more neurons in the heart than in the brain in the head. Um, and so there is a thinking that happens in the heart. But the funny thing is it doesn't think the same way the cranial brain thinks. According to James Hillman, if the heart thinks on images, mm -hmm. we imagine we're loving. So loving is thinking. Loving is to imagine. So I'm going to just pinpoint a very, a practice that I offer. And this practice certainly is nothing new it comes from quite ancient and indigenous practices especially practices that acknowledge all the directions south west east north the direction of above the direction of below and center seven uh, directions so i'm not um, taking any claims of having come up with this but what i do is to allow to guide people to feel their hearts and then to slowly begin their breath just to the space in front of the heart for a few moments and then allow the breath to travel to the right side of the heart and just spend some time so we go to the part that is behind the heart and then to the part that is on the left then below the heart and then above the heart which can include all the way above and then back to the center. And so that begins to open the space, open your heart, open the space with your awareness because you start to sense that also the heart has energy. So you start to feel the, feel the field of energy of your own heart. And it's an electromagnetic field. And so as you do, then I, something that I often uh, as is which direction is your heart leaning towards especially as you contemplate a dilemma in your life should I do this or not should I marry it or no or what do I do it's like okay not because one direction means one thing and the other direction means one thing but it's like if your heart is kind of taking you in that direction then follow <laughs> following mm -hmm. movement following dance following imagination following feelings and then embody that bring it into dance into an expression and most likely uh the process at at the end will will offer something and again when i say offer something i'm not necessarily necessarily saying something 
directly intelligible to the rational brain. So it may take some time to start to, you know, continue tending to that. Yes. I love the image of tending also, like tending to the garden, tending to the earth. It's like this caretaking that is mm, over and over daily practice, something yeah. regular, repetitive. Um, and this past summer, I did some expressive arts therapy work also. And um I remember how how blown I how blown away I was again. I love the Tamapa artwork. I think it's extraordinary. Uh, so this summer, <clears throat> my personal intention was to like envision my 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 love relationship or like my my life partner or something like this. And I have written a lot about this, and I have read about this, and done all kinds of work around this issue. And I remember. During the expressive arts therapy session, I did a, a drawing. It just came to me where I put my the things that I'd been thinking about into like an image. And all of a sudden, everything was just so clear to me. It was like with this visual image that came uh, out of me, you know, artistically, I, I got so much clarity about what I actually need and desire and I'm looking forward to. Yeah, so I think... Uh, the heart's ability to speak uh, either through intuition or some kind of sensation, vibration, or visually is sometimes a more direct route to understanding than uh, many other more mentally based practices. Yes. Well, what am I going to ask you next? I wanted to ask you also about heartbreak. What do we do? Is can movement and dance help us deal with the heartbreak? And maybe also some related concepts such as protecting the heart and building an armor around the heart during these uh, difficult experiences. What do you think? Yeah. Ooh, heartbreak. <laughs> yes. So I guess that's a current inquiry, not because I'm personally going through any heartbreak, but I've been really honing into, into it. And I'm curious as to what do we each understand as heartbreak? A falling apart, falling to pieces perhaps? And and so here we have then a way to go from an affliction of the heart and coming from Hillman's uh, literature, when an organ is wounded is when the organ, and this is my word, begins to sing its song. Before the wounding, so through the cracks of that wound to the hurt is when the energy comes forward. And before that wound, that energy was kind of dormant or unavailable or not so evident. So a matter to stay with, there, there tends to be an emphasis on the actual wounding, on the pain, on the, I'm going to use the metaphor of the cut or, you know, Mm -hmm. which is real and causes suffering and there is much more to it something is coming to your awareness it often happens that during heartbreak and by the way i have another um author to bring forward Jeanne paris she talks about heartbreak. She has a book called Heartbreak and compares that heartbreak. It's the, the suffering. There have been studies and researches that the pain it causes can be compared to that pain uh, experiencing torture when people have been tortured. 
like you know the heart doesn't know the difference if it's been tortured or it's more of an emotional pain so and yet it brings something forward and what i was going to say is that after the heartbreak there tends to be some kind of rumination going on what happened what did go wrong and am i ever going to be able to heal or to be whole again or to find someone or you know if i could take my words back and this and that so at first is that you know one one version of that that uh we may be engaging with some regret some i wish i didn't i wish it weren't um so that can then be taken into really a more of a a true inquiry, an opportunity to really know more about who we are. I don't know if this is coming across with the clarity that I'm intending to. Keep going. So what I'm saying is that at first it, make, it, it kind of sounds a little bit like a complaint and, you know, but if we stay with that and really tend to the voices, the messages that or the thoughts that come, we may start really to notice who were we in that particular relationship or circumstance before the heartbreak and learn how what we did or did not, didn't do played a part in the rupture. And so that way we can learn about ourselves and then take responsibility for our own heart heartbreak because we tend to blame the circumstance or the other person for breaking our hearts but in a way we can probably say something in me put me in this place because I needed to experience this to come to know myself in a way I haven't yet, or to come to experience myself in a way I haven't. Mm. I'm bringing awareness about who I've been. Mm. And now with awareness comes, do I wanna stick in that narrative or not? And so I'm maybe, this is a work in progress for me. So it's a little bit raw and I don't want to deny the pain. Mm. And the grief. I'm, I'm just saying that there's something something very rich you know underneath that pain or with that pain right right and um what's i gonna ask now i forget heartbreak heartbreak what would you tell somebody who <clears throat> who has experienced a difficult rupture let's say and as a result feels like well now I, I need to really protect myself against the uh, future pain of this magnitude and so that person builds like an armor that is important also to have because we also need to learn how to protect ourselves from because some of us can also be very uh, with the hearts too open and we 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 go quickly into big emotions and uh, and dynamics that maybe are not so great for us actually so protecting is important too but uh, so what would you tell to to a person who builds this armor and as a result is somehow like not able to fully like I feel like underneath this armor of the person is this unhealed heart that is now not unable to receive from the outside world because the Mm -hmm. the barrier is there how would you help somebody like this or what should we do for example I have uh, acquaintances like this and I don't know how to help them also because it's not up to me to somehow yeah know. yeah we each have our own path to walk we cannot mm -hmm. walk somebody else's path I I want to offer something that is not mine it's actually something that probably I watched uh, one video that you see in YouTube of Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. Mm -hmm. I don't know where is that video, but I I remember her words and the way, and I'm going to do what she did. Something along those lines as, you're hurting. 
your heart is hurting. You want to protect yourself. You don't want to let, you want to be close and not let anybody come to you. And then she said, that's all good. But please remember to, to leave your heart open to yourself. So your heart remains open for you. Yeah, you can leave everybody out, and but you don't close your own heart to yourself. And I feel that in that, I truly agree and resonate because that takes me to what, what I was just saying, that after a heartbreak, it's quite natural to want to retreat, to want to protect, but as far as holding this forever and ever, I'm not so sure. But this is important to do the repair work, to do the healing work, where you can then tend to your own story, restore your own story, recreate your own narratives, uh, and hopefully to forgive yourself, to forgive whoever, uh, to to get rid of some potential beliefs such as I will never because <laughs> yeah. that that comes automatically on heartbreak I will never blah 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 or I'm unlovable and we tell her we're really good in the western world at least to tell to speak to ourselves in a very harsh manner we don't quite learn how to speak to ourselves lovingly so I'm not necessarily someone who goes and tells people, do these affirmations. I, I, it's not my thing. What I do is that by virtue of staying in the process of tending to your heart, your own affirmations will come from that place. Mm. It happens over and over and over again when people that I work with in workshops after this dance and uh, you know, if your heart could speak, what would it say? There is the affirmation. That's the wisdom of the heart. Your heart is, my heart is telling me, stay with me a little longer. My heart is telling me, it's going to take time, but you're going to heal. My heart, all sorts of things. But they, they each, the, each person discovers their own voice and their own medicine on that. I'm not someone who is going to tell anybody what their medicine is mm. but i do provide some guidance for for each person to to find it i love the idea of keeping the heart open to myself mm. Mm, that's beautiful in your work do you see also <clears throat> not that i want to take this into a into a gender discussion but i sometimes feel like men in particular all of us, we need uh, we need help with the uh, heartbreak and finding the voice of the heart. But what about what about men? Do you feel like do you have uh, male clients, and do you feel like it's somehow different or more difficult for them to to deal with this, or it takes it's a bigger step to start doing this kind of work? Yeah, with movement, I mean movement and the heart matters together. I had very few, you know, women tend to gravitate towards my work. And so that's what I can speak about here with you. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that um, the, there, there's no, the heart is a heart beyond any gender. Um, and I do think that, that men have, have a very burdensome narrative that probably adds a layer <laughs> because because the cultural upbringing in the west i guess or mm -hmm. in the capitalist world however you want to put it so yeah that's my take but i cannot quite venture into speak specifically because it's not i don't have that much experience working with men and to understand more about uh, their own struggles and psychology. Mm -hmm. 
And I love this discussion about the heart. I mean, we've been talking about heartbreak and tending to the heart and finding the voice of the heart, but a whole other layer would be to focus on, <clears throat> on uh, heart, connection to heart as a way to bring more compassion and more peace to all kinds of relationships and work and life and the world in very, on a very, very large scale, not just in like some intimate dynamic with another person. Absolutely. Yeah, it's much more than a romantic uh, stance. It it just goes beyond that. Yeah, in a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I've come to take micro uh, practices, if you will. Um, so, you know, I, I teach and I see clients and... For me, it's important to, to be in my heart when I'm meeting them. So before a class, before a client, kind of take a brief moment and just check in with myself. And sometimes during the session or during teaching, I may notice that my heart may be starting to shrink or close. Yes. And I remember, because, you know, it's I'm not infallible. <laughs> I mean... Uh, my my heart closes too, uh, but then I I'm aware I I'm in this practice I remember and I I then come back to to let things in and in a way that I don't necessarily need to take it in but I let things in I don't know if it's a very subtle difference. It's not that I have to carry all of that with me because it's too much, but I can let it move through me. Mm. It circulate through my own circulatory system that has its own wisdom of continuous coming back and reoxygenation. But Maria Luisa, let's imagine a listener who says, but this sounds like an incredibly vulnerable way to live. <laughs> Doesn't it make you feel vulnerable? Yeah. And I rather stay vulnerable than closed off personally. Why? I don't know. I don't even know how to say about that. Mm -hmm. Because I feel this I feel more of what life is. Yes. And I feel reassurance in I'm going to get a little funny here, but in, in something larger. Yes. That it's, that it's somehow holding, at the very least, is this very own ground. Mm -hmm. So lay down on the ground, belly down or on my back and just feel the immense support. You know, that the sun rises, that the moon rises every night without me commanding it to. Yes. I can find solace and rest on that. So, and it's a it, it's a hunter culture thing. It's gone swimming upstream in a way. I know. Um, but I just I don't know how to go back to not. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. never... Again, sometimes I close off. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I feel the suffering, the constriction that it brings to me. And I'm like, why? And maybe also aging has been has been something that has helped me to be to be more like I'm more interested in living fully, feeling mm -hmm. fully than than not. What am I protecting myself from? Dying? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I feel personally when I'm in the in this heart energy, I I feel like I don't lack, you know. I feel like there's I'm connected to some some uh, bigger power and some greater resource, and it kind of flows through me. And I have I have plenty to give. Yes, it doesn't it doesn't it's vulnerable, but it's this kind of beautiful, vulnerable, and inspiring and joyful way to 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 live actually. But how to maintain myself on that vibration of love that takes practice, I think, for me at least. Right. 
And I guess is to clarify that my definition of vulnerability is not about weakness. Quite, mm -hmm. It's more about resilience than weakness. And resilience has a sense of strength. Yeah. And, and you, you know, to remember that the, the root word for courage yes. is more as hard, especially, mm -hmm. you know, French. So, yes. Uh, so there is this courage that comes with facing life fully. Yes. So, so let's put the heart open, that takes courage also. Yes, I agree totally. Yeah. So vulnerability is not a weakness in my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria Luisa, for this beautiful conversation. Is there anything that you want to add that I didn't ask you? Or maybe there are some final uh, tips or recommendations to the to the listener as to how to live, how to start living a more heartful life right now? Anything you want to add, really? Thank you. I would say, well, thank you. It's been really, I didn't expect it to kind of really move so deeply into my heart space <laughs> that's beautiful and to also show up with vulnerability knowing that this video will be living in the public domain but i just need to speak what i feel it's true for me at this moment in life which may change later but i guess you know if if i think i offer a few ways to connect with her and if something kind of click <laughs> then practice and if you want to contact me yes tell us how to i will put the link to your your website uh, yeah. in the description of the video also but tell us how to find you for example the six week uh, course sounds wonderful i think uh, you know we need to learn about the heart and how to tend to the heart yeah thank you i'll be uh teaching it in the new year uh probably in the first three months and probably sooner, probably starting the new year. Uh, I, I've been teaching it kind of starting the year in your heart space type of idea. I haven't put it on my website, but my website is mythiclife.net. And my email is mythiclifecenter at gmail.com. And, and it is the course uh, on an online course? Yeah, in Zoom. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So maybe maybe me and uh, some other listeners we will see all of we will see each other there and then we can yeah we can further generate, generate some some uh, heart space together. Yeah, because it's done in community and that's beautiful. That's beautiful too. Thank well, you. thank you so much for this inspiring conversation, and uh, dear listeners. We will see each other soon in another episode. Until then. Bye. Thank you.